Welcome to you know this typical summer Wellington day. Uh, um, coroner's Court, yes, something that we don't particularly like. And I'll always remember Sering. I always say, or actually I used to say, hey, look, you know, the coroner is not your big problem. You know, you don't have to fear the coroner. I mean, if this goes to HDC or you know medical council, that then it becomes a big problem. However, and we'll talk about this a little bit, a little bit later, there is a big however there. Um, so we'll just talk about you know, the role of the coroner, who the coroners are, and make a distinction between the actual the process of coroner's investigation, which is known as um, inquiry, and the inquest, which is the coroner's court. Quite often, you know, members are a little bit confused, you know, and ask, you know, is there going to be an uh, inquiry? Well, that's the whole thing is inquiry, but the inquest is, is, is different. Um, so what's the role of the coroner? They like to say, you know, the role of the coroner is to speak for the dead in order to protect the living. Um, they need to establish when, where, how, and why somebody died. When and where is usually pretty straightforward. How is a little bit more difficult. And why is probably the most difficult part. Um, and the main purpose of the whole coroner's process is to identify, to establish if anything can be done to minimize the risk of recurrence. Um, and then the coroners make recommendations. Um, and they usually say, you know, the coroner's role is not to apportion blame. So it's a kind of a fact-finding exercise. But now we're coming to that however, you know. How can you, if you identify a problem, I mean, you need to also identify where the problem is and who the problem is associated to, or actually who actually caused the problem. So it's very difficult not to, you know, put in writing in coroner's recommendations any sort of blame. So even though it's not the sort of blame finding exercise, it's not the main purpose of the coroner's inquest, it's difficult to avoid not being blamed if there is something or someone to blame. Um, in recent times, actually, I, I might leave that for a little bit later. So uh, um, coroners are sort of qualified lawyers, like Matthew. Um, they are appointed under the Coroner's Act 2006 as um, judicial officers. At the moment, Deborah Marshall is the chief coroner, and there's 16 coroners across New Zealand 15 at the moment, I think Matthew isn't it? I mean, the, uh, Gary Evans from Wellington actually just resigned, um, or retired, not resigned, retired yesterday. Um, so the whole process is call, called inquest, uh, uh, inquiry, and only part is inquest. So the death, when the death is reported to coroner, I mean, you know about how, how that goes, um, coroner conducts an investigation, inquiry, so collects or documentation, clinical notes, and then you know you get that nice little letter saying, you know, please provide your report because clinical notes are not enough. Um, and that's what you do. You provide your report, and then the coroner can ask reports for other, other people who are involved in the case, can go back to you for additional, you know, questions to clarify additional, additional um, uh, questions gets a post-mortem. Um, post-mortem, I mean, sometimes the coroners are quite happy to provide that to, to clinicians, which is very, very useful, you know, because in, it informs you basically how to, well, structure your report if you know the exact cause of death. Um, sometimes they are reluctant to do that, but in recent times, you know, we haven't had a problem with coroners actually uh, giving us the results of post-mortem. Um, they sometimes arrange expert opinions, 
um, to comment on you know the, 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 the practice of and, and the care provided in this context you know care provided to, to people um, and then they can conduct interviews they regularly speak to families of course and it's very very difficult very you know sort of important how the families think about you know care provided because that, that sort of directs the coroner whether to go to inquest, whether to arrange an inquest or the court. Um, I mean, two reasons, two main reasons why the coroners would arrange an inquest. One is it's a complex case. It's um, you know very the case which they are not sure about how to address what what really happened. So they arrange an inquest. Um, if the person is under the Mental Health Act, then 99.9% .9 of the times they will arrange an, an inquest, um, although they don't have to, really, but they always, always do. And another important thing is how the family think about the case. If the family is unhappy with what happened, and if they put a pressure on the coroner, they are more likely to go for an inquest than, than not. Sometimes they make decision, what they call in chambers or on papers. Sometimes they arrange telephone conference with those involved. Um, but when they, they, they arrange an inquest, that's the part that you know can be a little bit problematic. It's, not, it's like, a, like a court, not exactly like a criminal court. This is not a criminal process, definitely. But it's like a court where the judge is um, uh, where the coroner is judge and they are lawyers and but you know Matthew will talk about it a little bit more I just want to go back to that you know however that I started with in recent times we sort of notice a little trend should I go I should maybe still call it trend where coroners are much sort of happier and you know, easy to pass their concerns to the regulators, to Medical Council, and to the HDC. So that's, and that's, that's a big problem. So we are monitoring that, and if that continues, we'll have to do something formal about it, because in the past, that happened very, very rarely, only when there would be something really, really, when they would be really worried about um, uh, something that happened, they could then, you know, they have, you know, statutory rights to do that, you know, so there's not a lot that we can actually do if they really sort of take that, uh, um, that path, but we'll, we'll try. So in, in, in last month, I think there were two cases when the coroners referred their concerns to, uh, to the HDC. Um, asking HDC first to, you know, address the problem before they pass their, uh, uh, their judgment or, or findings. Um, so that's the problem, and I will now, you know, ask Matthew to take you to, well, exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Um. I'm Matthew McClelland, I'm a barrister in Wellington and uh, I do work for the, the MPS. Um, I'm not going to um, give you chapter and verse and all the technical stuff about um, inquests and the coroner's act because there is a, a stunningly brilliant book um, available, uh, written by me, um, <laughs> which, which, which sets it all out for you, so, um, so uh, you, you're very lucky. Um, I was going to start by saying that, that um, the, under the Coroner's Act 2006, the court has the ability to make practice notes, and um, they're supposed to guide you on how to approach an inquest, and, and one of the first things I was going to tell you, but uh, since 2006, there have been no practice notes, that's what I was going to tell you until I thought I'd better check which I did this morning, I checked, and there are about six practice notes, so um, they also, they're not quite as cleverly written as the book, but they give you a bit of an idea of, of what to expect when uh, um, you go to a coroner's inquest. Um, Jarko has covered 
quite a bit of what I was going to say, but, but I think for most of you, the first you'll really know about your involvement or your impending involvement in, a, in an inquest is you'll get a ring or a letter passed on through the DHB to you asking you to provide a report. Um, it's either directed specifically to you or it's to the DHB asking them to arrange for reports for those people involved in the deceased care. Um, and that, to me, is the most crucial time um, when faced with an in inquest or, or a coroner's inquiry because it's your first report that really um, lays the way, the foundation for what happens uh, going forward. Um, it, it is very important when you get that request when you draft your report uh, to get MPS involvement. Um, that is critical in my view. Uh, so what you do is they ask you to prepare a report. You're not allowed to refuse to, you have to prepare it. And normally you, you do your report and you send it through to the DHB who send it off to the coroner. Um, but that report really is the basis for everything that, go, that, that occurs thereafter. A and it will be looked at by the coroner it will be looked at by the family of the deceased. It will be looked at any other experts that may be giving evidence. It could be looked at by the HDC and it could be looked by the Medical Council. So you've got to get it right and you've got to get it right at the outset. So when you do that report, you've got to make sure you've got all the information available to you, the notes, the x-rays and, and whatever else there might be. And you've got to make sure that your report is accurate and you should focus your report on what you have done, the involvement that you've had in the, in the patient's care. Don't start answering for other people. Um, it's your report and you're not really in a position to say what Tom, Dick or Harry might or might not have done. So stick to what you know. Um, don't um, go outside of your, your, your area of expertise. Um, just explain what your role in this patient's care is and then send your draft report to MPS and the MLAs like JARCO or, or whoever will go through that and, and ensure that, that your report is succinct and doesn't expose you to, to potential problems further down the track. Um, more often than not, the DHB and, the, um, and, and your uh, interests are aligned, but that's not always the case. And, and, um, so if you are submitting your report to a DHB, you need to say, this is my report, I don't want you to change it. If you do want to change it, please discuss any changes with me first. Um, because I've certainly seen instances where a DHB has taken it upon itself to um, change a report without the report writer's knowledge. And when he's come to give evidence and be cross-examined, um, he, he's put in quite a difficult position. So it, it's always important to just make sure that the DHB understands it doesn't want, um, you don't want your report changed. Um, in your report, you've got to be accurate, you've got to be courteous, try and speak in, in as plain a English as possible. Um, and those are really about the only things you need to, to be. The, the, um, it's helpful, I think, to e express condolences where appropriate. Some, um, when giving evidence in an inquest, will, will get into the witness box and say, I'd just like to express my condolences, etc. to the family. Personally, I, I don't, um, that's not the way I, I would like to do it. My, my preference, and normally my advice, is to say to the doctor, go, or I'll go and see the police who prosecute, and the, or not prosecute, but who present the evidence in an inquest, and just say, look, can I go and see the family? I just want to say hello and just reintroduce myself and, and express my condolences. To me, that, that is the better way um, to do it. Um, the other thing is apologies. Um, if you've got it wrong, if you've got it really, really wrong, and, and there's no dispute about that, then I think it's important to apologise, and apologise in your report, and apologise in the court, and when you're giving evidence. And, and I can think of one quite recent example where 
a doctor or a surgeon, I think it was, got it, got it wrong. And, and there was no debate about that. And, and right from the outset, he had fronted that and said, look, I've made an error. He gave evidence. He, he looked at the family and said, look, I'm sorry, I, I, I've made a mistake. And, and, uh, and um, that was fantastic. It, it was very heartfelt. The media published it, and, and they published it um, very appropriately. They, they reported it very appropriately. And the coroner, um, clearly, clearly he wasn't used to having apologies like this, because he, he addressed it in several paragraphs, just saying how appropriate and good it was that the surgeon had faced up to it and, and made a very public apology. And, and that went down um, extremely well. Um, Sometimes um, you will be asked to provide expert opinion for, for the coroner. Um, I just remind you that, that um, you may be asked to give expert opinion, but maybe next time you might be the one who, who all the attention is focused on. So don't give, your, don't give, give the gold standard advice. Don't give advice or, or an expert opinion from, from uh, Ivory Tower. Just give your advice um, as to what the accepted standards may be. And, and I think it's really important that, that um, when giving an expert opinion, you, you just hold yourself back, uh, express an opinion that, that you are comfortable with and, and one that doesn't uh, do the gold standard. Um, Jarko has talked about the chambers vis-a-vis -vis or versus the full inquest. A chamber's inquest is just when the, the coroner does it on the papers, another reason why you should do a good report at the outset. Um, if the coroner thinks, well, there's good, I'm not likely to be making an adverse finding or an adverse comment about anyone, if he thinks it's um, uncontroversial, then he or she are likely to, to um, say that the inquest should be by way of a chamber's hearing um, on the papers. If it looks like it's going to be controversial, if there's a lot of media attention, um, then the coroner is, is likely to decide to have a full inquest hearing. I should just pause there. I don't know if anyone saw the paper this morning, but um, now, with Gary Evans' retirement, there, there are more women, female coroners as opposed to male coroners, which is a first, I think, in the judiciary um, in New Zealand. So. So that, that's quite, um, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, yes, yes, I do see that. Sorry, did I? <laughs> I certainly see that as positive. Um, <laughs> um, the, the um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. The hearing, um, when you get notice of a hearing, and, and more often than not, you just you submit your final report and then you don't hear a thing. And it's a bit like the HDC, you sort of left waiting for, for some time. But then you'll, you'll get a, a week or a w couple of weeks notice saying, oh, you've got to give evidence. Again, um, you should approach MPS because MPS more often than not will arrange for you to have legal representation at the inquest and, and, and that's always um, important. Um, the coroner can appoint counsel assisting, um, and, and that is a, a lawyer whose role it is, in theory, to, to, um, ex to assist in getting the information out, out of the witnesses um, and before the coroner. Unfortunately, some counsel assisting see their role more as a prosecutor, and, and, um, and they can engage in quite serious um, cross-examination of the various witnesses. But as I say, the MPS lawyer will, will help you through that. Um, also, in, in some cases, as you can imagine, the family are upset and they may well engage a, a lawyer um, to represent their interests. And again, they can, uh, those lawyers um, really uh, cross-examine and although um, the role of the coroner is not to apportion blame. Uh, those being cross-examined might see it um, otherwise. Um, but as I say, the MPS lawyer will, will um, assist you in, in all of that. After the hearing, 
Um, if there is going to be an adverse comment, the coroner has to um, circulate his draft findings, his provisional findings, and you are then, if you're the subject of the adverse comment, given an opportunity to respond to that adverse comment. If the comment is based on a misunderstanding of the facts, then more likely than not, the coroner will change that adverse comment. If uh, your response is simply that you don't agree with the comment, then it's unlikely that the coroner will change his or her position, um, but there will be a reference somewhere in the final uh, findings about um, that you, you hold a different view, you don't agree with that opinion. And, and then name suppression, and, and um, name suppression is something of, of significant interest to, I suspect, all of us in this room. In the old days before the 2006 um, Act came, in, came into being, um, more often than not, the coroner would grant a, a doctor a, a pairing um, name suppression. And, and um, it was almost a given, you just put your hand up and say, well, doctor, whatever, would like name suppression, and um, the coroners generally gave name suppression. That now has all changed, primarily because of a case called Gravit, um, which involved a young medical student who died of meningococcal disease. And um, uh, there was an in well, no, in fact, there wasn't an inquest. That was all done on the papers. But, but the finding of the coroner effectively was that, that this young man died through systemic failures. And he granted name suppression to all the medical practitioners involved. Um, Mr. Gravett, the father, um, judicially reviews, reviewed the coroner's decision. And the High Court held no it had been wrong to grant all the doctors name suppression. And in fact, his, his reasoning was, because it was systemic errors, there would be no criticism in the media of the doctors involved, um, which the next day was shown to be completely incorrect because the media um, were quite critical of various aspects of the care provided. Um, but, but when considering whether to give name suppression, uh, the coroner has to look at the, whether suppression is in the interests of justice, in the interests of decency, public order, personal privacy, or, or a combination of those. And, and the way the courts are looking at it now is that the interests of justice um, and will, will um, supersede all the other interests. So unless you have got really, really good grounds uh, to request name suppression, it's probably not um, worth your while even making a request. And, and the grounds are if there are some particularly strong personal private reasons, um, then the, the coroner will take those into account. But they have to be very strong uh, private reasons. Um, one I can think of involved a, a midwife case up in up in Hamilton um, last year, I think it was, and, and the midwife had been threatened with violence from various gang members, family gang members, and in that case, uh, she was granted name suppression. But generalised fear or stress of being named is simply isn't sufficient. Um, where, where vulnerable patients may be involved in one way or another, then, then that may be sufficient, but as I say, it, it, it is probably not worth your while even contemplating name suppression un, unless you have very good reasons. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, don't forget the, the book. And, um, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions that there may be.